what, what an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I've kind of dreamt of this day. I kind of imagined and envisioned this day coming, I don't know, probably for the last seven years, I would say. I, I knew that I would end up speaking here at some point. And um, there's been a whole track. Once, I mean, I think all of us are Walter Russell fans to a certain extent, right? We, we know about his work. There's something that resonates in his work. Uh, I came upon Walter's work in 2015, and uh, whereupon I devoured every one of his books. I mean, I basically read it all, and um, I, I found his works to be so profound and transcend transcendent. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here, and it's a great honor, and I'm very humbled to be here. So we're going to start off today. We're going to learn a little bit about mathematics today. It's like I know usually when people hear about mathematics, they're like, oh, no way, yuck, right? It's because we haven't learned math the right way. So it's been one of the great joys of my life and career to teach mathematics. And I had something like over 10,000 people take my mathematics courses this year already, which has been wow for me. And I can't tell you how many incredible messages I get and letters from people saying, I'm in love with math. And I hated math. I absolutely hated math. But the good news is if you can hate something, you can love it too. It's a fine line, right? And we've all learned that through life. I looked at math in a very different way. I looked at it more from a linguistic perspective. Because so I had already learned these languages. I lived in nine countries. I got to learn eight languages. I got to become fluent in you know, five languages. And when I started looking at math, I noticed that there were certain common aspects of mathematics that mirrored linguistic sort of characteristics and syntax and even, even kind of the, the way we name things in mathematics and nomenclature. So I started thinking, geez, this is, a, this is a language. And as I started diving deeper and deeper into that language, I really wanted to understand it. And just as Walter Russell said, eventually, and this is on this pamphlet I just saw, it's science that will prove the divine. And we're seeing this already. You know, we saw it in 2012 when the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN. And they co-named it the God particle. So it's really interesting to see how things, we tend to see society in a very polarized way where we say, okay, this is a Democrat, this is a Republican. They're sort of like left and right. But actually it's not really that way, it's a circle. Because when you step to one other step over, going to more extreme left, you think that's communism, but actually communism always manifests as fascism. And I cannot find a single example where that has not been the case. Whether you have Hitler running on a social democratic platform that then becomes a fascist regime in the Third Reich, or whether you have Kim Jong-un as an example today, who claims to be a social democrat but actually acts in every way, shape, or form as a fascist. And you can always tell a fascist regime when you go to a country, and I've traveled to over 140 countries, I know when I'm in a fascist regime when I see large pictures of the leader everywhere. <laughs> because in this society, everyone's intended to be equal, but it turns out some are more equal than others. So, the point being that it's a circle, it's a sphere. What we look at in dualistic terms is not really truly dualistic. It's just an inverse of each other. That's why you can very easily fall in love with things that you once hated. So let's get into the math. I'm gonna start by giving you a short presentation that was made by Alan Green, who's a colleague of mine. He's a cryptologist. He's a very talented musician and mathematician. And he took my work on looking at waves. So you've all read The Secret of Light, right? Which is all about the wave, right? The entire universe can be looked at inside the dynamics of waves. And mathematics describes those waves. There's not a single thing, even down to emotions, that we could not apply some form of mathematical language towards it. I'll repeat that. There's not a single thing that happens, even emotions. And I could even say that I believe that the only real things in this universe are the emotions we feel, either from our incorrect misperceptions, right, or from our correct 
perceptions. The emotion is what makes it real. Voice. And the one became many. against their fractals or inverse decimal and angular values on a circle, expanding upon the study of quaternion symmetry. Nikola Tesla asserted that the secrets of the universe are embedded in the numbers three, six, and nine. And so Grant postulated the hexagonal integer six to be the center the mirror reflection crossover point from which, radiating outward, numbers converge and overlap at various nodes. He hypothesized that numbers both create and emerge out of these wave propagations, and thus all constants manifest at the geometrical intersections between their x and one of x representations. The first of these conjunctions occurs at the center where the golden ratio phi and its one over x little phi manifest. These are framed by the euler mascheroni constant gamma and its close inverse, the square root of three. The next conjunctions manifest fractals of pi and the euler number e. These are framed by the cube root of gamma and a light speed reference C against E minus two and a presently unknown new constant. The next conjunction manifests the squares of phi framed by its square root and the fine structure constant alpha, giving rise to yet another pair of new constants. At the Tesla integers three and nine, we find pi and its one over x fractal, which reveal 3.1623, a most significant balance between pi and its inverse, producing two more brand new constants. Moving further out, each subsequent framing simultaneously converges and diverges like concave and convex lenses, concentrating and dispersing energy. Thus we can see visually how the separation of light and dark is achieved mathematically. And perhaps we begin to understand more fully how the Einsteinian concept itself of space-time emanates from precisely such a dynamic wave function. As already shown, this new understanding predicts that at each halving of a wave, another mirroring constant must inherently result from the convergence. 
We are therefore able to predict with mathematical certainty where new, presently unknown constants will be found along an infinitely ever-expanding wave. Thus, from a simple x against 1 over x analysis, a unifying mathematical theory emerges, revealing an elegant structure hidden within an age-old mystery. Since all the major constants, pi, phi, e, alpha, appear at these convergences, and presently unknown constants are now geometrically predictable, we see they are all pure quaternion reflections of the most fundamental constant of all, the integer 1. These findings even suggest that ancient references to a voice of many waters may literally be an accurate metaphor. Developing a unique variant of the original Pythagorean tuning, which postulates that true A above middle C should be 432 cycles per second, or hertz. Grant has found that the musical notes themselves emerge from the intersections of these overlapping waves. Their hertz values correspond exactly to their angular relationships on a circle, requiring only minimal equal temperament adjustments to become a viable tuning alternative. And thus we have come, one might say, full circle to the pure, balanced alchemy of science and art, resolving the chaos of the many back into the unity of the one. Uh, everyone okay? You have Before we go on, and not just for you guys here in the room, but the people that are joining us virtually, are there any questions about that? <laughs> because you better ask now or forever hold your peace. No, I'm kidding. No, go ahead and ask any questions about that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's my book called Philomath. But you can also, if you want to learn about that without having to buy the book, you can go onto my website, robertedwardgrant.com. So real simple. And then just go to, uh, to the paper section. There's a publication section in there in the about. So go to about and find publications. And there's a paper called The Wave Constant Theory. There's two papers I recommend reading, the wave number theory and the wave constant theory. And those are two white papers uh, that we published, but they ended up in the book also. So if you, they're both in the book. Any other questions? There's another question over here. Yes. I'm assuming the Fibonacci sequence fits in here somewhere. It does. It does. But I'll hold that one and show you how, because I can show it to you visually. Another question? Yes. Snell's window, you know about that. That's really interesting. You notice that there was a reference to concave and convex mirrors, right? Convex lenses. I do a lot of work. I mean, how did I know that, you know, you, know, you don't know how your life and what the reason for your life is until you can see it in the retrospect. And then you see how all the dots connect. If you've ever seen Steve Jobs talk, uh, where he spoke at Stanford for the graduation, and he talks about he had no idea why he went into typesetting. And then later on, that became a, such a fundamental aspect of you know, why he chose to make laser printers and everything. Because remember how we used to, I'm old enough, I remember this. We used to have everything be very, very sort of bit mapped. It looked kind of funny. It didn't have these beautiful type settings that, that you could print books from practically now. And he could connect all those dots as to why he did that. Well, for me, it was optics. So not many people would even know Snell's right window. But it's a reference to, and there's actually very interesting pyramid optics inside of, of Snell's windows. So it's a lot to explain, but maybe what I'll do is I'll come back after 
on, on how it does work. But yes, it's all related to convex, concave lenses and the way the water basically intersects. Right? You could think about a wave as water or you could think of it any other type of electromagnetic you know, perturbation. They have intersections and there's specific geometries that come off of and emerge from those intersections and that's what's defining all the mathematical constants. So there's literally a language to it and it's a very beautiful language and that's why we look at things like flower of life and we say, oh, that looks really beautiful. It's because you can literally make all geometric solids from that. Just from a simple six point taking to 12 point or 24 point geometry and if you look at Walter's case over here, there's one that's got this, you know, he called it crystallography. And he's got a 24 point circle, right, around it and lines connecting all those 24 points. And what I do to discover new geometric forms that I've discovered about 40 now is I take that exact format and look inside of it to see where I see patterns on what might form a three dimensional object, right? And so that's how the grantahedron was born, that's how the ankahedron was born, that's how all these new geometric forms were totally born out of that work. And now the artist, Anthony James, is making them to put into hotels and everything, which is pretty cool. We're, I, I met with his team about a month or so ago, and they're designing them now. And they, you've probably seen them at like St. Regis, these gigantic geometric structures, right, that are you know, usually about this tall, and they've got like light boxes inside them, so you can look at them forever. There's a light box over here too that I saw yesterday, it was pretty cool. Similar, but these are much larger for like entrances to hotels and everything. And so it's been really cool to like talk to their engineers on what it might look like. To have a 16 sided, you know, a polyhedra with 16 sides that actually is pentagons on each of those sides. And normally, you know, there's only 12. We know about the 12 sided and that's the dodecahedron but I found a way to do it 16-sided and it closes perfectly. And you'll see it here in the course of my presentation. But the, the whole convex concave optics thing is actually a challenge of mathematics. It's because everything can be defined in mathematical terms. The concave convex lens issue is actually about right triangles and prime number factorization. That's what it really comes down to and that's what I did a lot of work on, on when I started looking at Snell's because I also design lenses that go inside the eye for like cataract treatments, et cetera. But we'll come back to that. Another question. Yes. Wasn't it with Galileo who created the first convex, convex lenses, right? For the telescope, yeah. yeah. I think it probably, I think Ptolemy had something like this mm -hmm. as well. So I don't know if it was him for sure. I know that. Uh, even Hypatia, who was uh, the daughter of Theon, who was a Greek mathematician who was responsible for the Library of Alexandria, who did a lot of research on conical studies and a lot of the, I mean, she's the only famous Greek mathematician that we know about. So I named one of my products after her. It's our best encryption technology they called Hy Hypatia. Hmm? They, they did. It was a very sad story. That's why I named the product after her because not only does she not get all the recognition I think she deserves, um, but also because um, you know, she was killed by an angry mob of Christian zealots who were basically Coptics. And, uh, and they killed her in the streets after raping her. It was a really terrible, terrible story. The, the, the question I was going to ask was, um, my understanding is that the reason Shrek and Toy Story came out and were so different is because uh, DreamWorks figured out, or somebody figured out the math of emotions and a friend of mine actually did a turnaround there, one of my colleagues, and he said that the, the, the reason it was so hard is because there was an entire layer of beyond animation mm -hmm. complicated already mm -hmm. that was a complete map of emotions, and that's how emotions are being programmed into the cartoon. So Shrek was the first time that cartoon drawings wow. would... Had that animated look, very, very, like... Emotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Not, not surprising. One more question. Yes. I was assuming you were into this kind of thing even before you found Walter Russell, I guess. You said you found him in 2015. I was into this stuff um, for about, I would say it started for me about 2008. And then by about 2010, I went to Hong Kong on a business trip. And it's when I was CEO of Bausch & Lomb Surgical, which is a giant company. And I was there to go and meet 
our new country manager for Thailand. And I was fascinated because the guy that had been running Thailand for the last five years wanted to bring someone else to be his boss. And so I thought, why would someone do that if they've already got the freedom of being the boss? And, and I found out it was because it was his mentor that had left for five years to do five years as a, a monk in a monastery. And he hadn't talked. He had a vow of silence for five years. So he hadn't talked to anybody. So I was the first person he was going to talk to, right? <laughs> and... You know, I'm a, we're in the salad bar line in, in like some hotel, and I think it was Hyatt Regency in Hong Kong. And like, I'm like leaning over the salad. We don't have salad bars much anymore, right? Leaning over the salad bar line, I'm like, hi. <laughs> I'm like, so uh, what was it like to have a five-year vow of silence? And he said, he said, nice. <laughs> So, so then I said, can I ask, what, what did you learn from it? And he said, there is no duality. So talk about, you know, speak less, communicate more, right? He said, it's all an illusion. Duality is an illusion. There's only oneness. And that haunted me on the flight home. So I, I remember thinking to myself, what the heck does that even mean? What do I mean non-duality? Everything has duality. So I started writing down on my notebook all the things that were sort of like positives in my mind, and then all the things that were negatives in my mind. So humility is a good thing, but arrogance is a bad thing, right? And so all the antonym relationships I could think of, and I wrote down 150 terms. I still have the notebook page. And then I realized that in every single case, what I had previously perceived as being wholly separated and disparate concepts, they were the same thing, just different degrees of the same thing. And it was actually a circle. So I started thinking, well, can I think of someone who is actually arrogant in their humility? Yeah, there's a word called pious, right? That's, yes. <laughs> there are lots of people that have arrogance in their humility. And you start thinking about this, and usually then I start realizing all the things that people judge in other people it's usually the thing they themselves are doing. So it's like, if you spot it, that means you got it. <laughs> so this was like profound for me, super profound. And then I started noticing number synchronicities after that. And this continued on and on, but it was like just normal until I went to Harvard Business School. And I was at, I'd done the advanced management program at Harvard Business School for many years, but I was hosting a group of about 50 physicians in a program that I had created <clears throat> called the Executive Management Program for Physicians, specifically. And so while I was there, I had to get these fingerprints taken. And I could not, you know, I didn't really know what the fingerprint thing was for. Someone just told me, you got to go and do fingerprints. It was for a company I was founding, and I was getting a FINRA license for. <clears throat> FINRA is like a, you know, to get from the SEC <coughs> permission, excuse me, to be able to do, you know, like an investment bank or something. And so I, uh, I ended up getting my fingerprints taken, and the guy that was doing the fingerprints had been uh, treated poorly by my business partner, who I'd been partners with for like 20 years. He felt he was treated poorly anyway, and I said, I'm sorry, my partner's not usually rude like that, but he wants to get back in the lecture. He doesn't want to miss the lecture that's going on. It was a lecture done by Frances Fry, who's a famous um, professor at Harvard Business School. It's one of the best. And she's this militant style, and she, that's her own self-description, by the way, militant style lesbian, who will absolutely like pound you into the ground if you don't listen to her lecture. If you're not paying attention, she's one of those that's going to call you out and like, wrap you on the, on the knuckles type of things. Like, what are you doing? And, and so he's like, I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this. I'm gonna, if I don't know what's going on, he's just going to like smack me. And so I said, I'm sorry for my partner being, but I'd already seen her lectures before because I had her, she was one of my professors when I was in school. And, and so he, um, he, says, uh, he says, don't worry, it's only because of his past life. <laughs> and they didn't say anything. I'm like, you got to tell me, you can't just like throw that out there. It's like, come on. And he's like, oh, it's because your business partner in his past life, his job was to be an elephant caretaker. Oh. Wow. Now, this guy was like 
vice chairman of Deutsche Bank, <laughs> right? He had been, right? It was like, he was a banker, very successful, the top banker in all of healthcare. And, and I finally recruited him to be my partner when I founded my company. And I said, dude, I think you're the oldest banker I know. Do you want to be a banker waiting for black cars forever? Like, seriously? And he finally, you know, acquiesced and came over to work with me. But I, the moment this guy says he was an elephant caretaker, my brain was transported immediately to his apartment in New York City, in the Trump Tower, of course, right? The golden frickin' Trump Tower. And his apartment was full of pictures of elephants. <laughs> and I remember, I remember, this is just like, I'm remembering, I'm like, I've stayed in his apartment, I'm like, his house is full of freaking elephants. <laughs> and I asked him, I'm like, why do you have so many elephants? And he's like, they're the kindest, most gentle creatures. Just like that, he's an Indian guy. And, and I'm like, wow, he goes, plus I, I follow, I worship Ganesh. That's his God that he worships. And I'm like, okay, wow, you just either like pulled one out of the ether and just like nailed it. But he's like, don't worry, I have something for you also. <laughs> And he takes out 10 photographs out of his briefcase. He goes, this is just my day job to meet the people I'm supposed to meet. <laughs> and he pulls out 10 photographs that are from 1930s and 1940s. And he spreads them out on the table in front of us. And uh, it was right next to the stuff where he has for the notary. He's just a notary, right? And, um, and he says, pick the one that you recognize. And it was a photograph of Franklin Delano Roosevelt giving a stump speech in 1942 in Boston. And something about it resonated with me immediately. And I was like, that one. The other ones I had no recollection of at all. And I said, this one looks familiar, but I don't, and I do have a photographic memory. I couldn't remember where I'd seen it before. Like I couldn't, normally I could say, oh yeah, I saw, I saw this on such and such date, such and such hour. Like I have that kind of accuracy of remembrance. And I couldn't, I couldn't place it. I'm like, I don't know why, but I recognize it. And he said, it's for you, keep it. So I went back to my desk. I opened my notebook to take notes for this production operation management course. It was like the most banal, boring topic in the world taught by the militant lesbian teacher. <laughs> I, I opened my notebook and I'm not listening to the lecture. And I just start writing out tons and tons of math and physics. And I never connected even tens of thousands of pages. How many of you have been following my work for a long time, for a while? For a while. Yeah, for a while. And, and so I never connected that until long after, you know, that it had something to do with that photograph. I never connected it until I was filing patents on some of the work that I've been writing out. I have about 55 patents now on the work that relates, a lot of it relates to this, but also in optics. And, and laser and, you know, light-based technologies. Yes? Okay. Well, to finish my question, my actual question was, so how much of, like, this and kind of what we saw, seen, or kind of feel like, um, it has been influenced by Walter Russell's work after you... So once I found... So the way I found out about it was that we were filing patents on, like, all kinds of stuff. 4D printers of matter, and if you go on my website, you could read all the patents that we have as well. And um, so I went, I had this engineer who worked on my team, he was young, he's now CEO of one of our companies. We have 17 companies in our portfolio now. And uh, basically he, he was doing this work to look up prior art, because you can't file patents if there's prior art on something, or at least if the prior art is not directly related, you still have to cite the prior art so that you don't get called out or invalidated later on for not having cited the prior art, right? Prior art just means another person had an idea similar to your idea, right, or tangential at least to your idea that might have informed your thinking on your idea, right? Um, but by the way, on that topic, I don't believe our brains are storage devices. I don't believe our brains are at all what we think they are. We tend to believe in the school system, we want to cram as much as we can inside your brain, right? And then, of course, some of it falls out. <laughs> and then you try to cram back more in your brain, and then some falls out again. And it's a whole battle of attrition, right? You're like trying to go back and forth. How much can I cram inside my brain? Well, I think that's the mistake, first and foremost, that our brains actually, I believe, are radio receivers and processors. Yes. And 
that each of us, according to our emotional state, that's what's real, right? Each of us can actually tune into higher states of awareness and tap into this field of, called the morphogenetic field by some, called the Akashic record by others, right? That there's something there to that. And if your emotional state is low, you will not tap, you'll only, you'll be blocked from being able to get access. It's like, it's like the dial on a radio tuner, right? You can't listen to 107.5 if you're tuned to 98.6, right? It's just not gonna happen. It's the same thing with each of us. And so I, I believe that, that that's what Walter was tapping into. Now what happened was also, and this is why I filed many patents that people around the world have also filed patents on the same invention at the exact same time, right, that I've never met. I had no idea who they were, have no idea, never had a discussion with them. So to me, it's like there's a radio frequency going out and some people can tune into that frequency and others just don't, right? It's like Leonardo da Vinci says, there are three types of people, those who can see, I would say see and hear probably, those who can see once shown and those who don't see. It's kind of pretty simple. So when I had my engineer guy come back to me and say, hey, I did a prior art search and I found one guy who had done work uh, similar to your work on periodic elements. Because I'd already drawn the whole thing out. It was drawn like a snake. You'll see the photograph of it in a little bit. But I had all the frequencies associated with it. And it was kind of funny because uh, John made a mistake. He said that one of my companies was called Alphanon. No, the name of my company, you just read it wrong, was Alpheon. But if you recognize Walter's work, you know that his first element on his periodic elements was Alphanon. I'd already had that company for four years. I named it, right? And, and I, I remember seeing that too. I was like, whoa, that's weird. That's very bizarre. But I think that from the moment that he brought over to me the, the, the work, you know, and I Googled it, and I'm like, oh, wow, who's this Walter Russell guy? Then I was like transfixed. And what I was astounded by was how all of his work like was missing all the math. It's missing the math. The only math that it has inside of it, it's like a framework almost. It's, it's like it's missing the cipher and the cipher is math. So there's, the only math you'll find in there is doubling math. So he has like maybe four or five images that he talks about universal mathematics. And those images are doubling math. One doubles two, two, four, four, eight, eight, 16, 16, 32, right? It's just two to each power all the way up. And then the other math that he has is directly from the tetractus, which is just four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four. There's no other math that you really see. If you go in that room, you'll see it's all related to this. And so what I was seeing was very similar imagery in my head to the same stuff as Walter Russell's work, like identical. But what was coming along with it was all the math. So that's what I've been publishing, is all the mathematics. And, and I think you know, it's extremely consistent with what Walter has seen. And some of them were almost identical before I'd even known who Walter was. And then later I was like, well, geez, you know, if Walter is drawing all this structure in here, then I could probably use this structure to be able to pull out of that field the mathematics so that it can actually adequately be described. And I think Walter left out the math on purpose. And there's, that's a whole other discussion. We can go into it a little bit. Okay, I'll go ahead and get into the presentation. So, we stand at the precipice of a very interesting point in time. We've been taught that everything is dual. We've been taught that science and spirituality are two very separate things. I would assert to you today that the highest level of science will only be achieved through the doorway of spirituality. And that the highest level of spirituality will only be achieved through the doorway of science. The two are irrevocably connected. It's a left and right brain synchrony that brings us to higher order awareness of self 
and the understanding that this is not a universe around us, but actually a U inverse. That we will continue to attract everything that we judged around the world and everything around us until we no longer judge everything we attracted. We're not here to learn more judgment. We're inculcated with concepts of judgment and duality from the moment we're born. That's so that we can experience separation. That's so that we can eventually transcend it. The whole reason we're here is just to learn to love. It's really simple. We complicate it. But there's a pathway to be able to get to that understanding. And it's so beautiful and it's so intricate. And the math of it, the language just permeates through everything. So we're now at the stage where mankind is about to go to that next level. One of the first patterns I saw was, of course, the Fibonacci. Now, a lot of people see this, right? There was even a TV show called Touch that came out in like 2009 or 10 that talked about Fibonacci patterns. But one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Fibonacci, of course, we know that it's like from here to my wrist versus this. This is going to be 1.618 of this distance to here, right? From pupil to pupil is 1, and from temple to temple is 1.618, right? And it's a unique number because it's the only number that if you take your, take, who has a calculator? Who has a phone, iPhone? Pull out your iPhone. I'm going to do a little math. So turn your phone sideways if you've got an iPhone. The way you calculate the golden ratio is to take the square root of 5. So the square root of 5, that's like this. So you just take your 5 and then square root that. It's 2.236, right, with an infinite tail on it. Add 1, and then divide that by 2. So that's 1.618033987. Now, what's unique about this number is it's the only number. It's important you remember this, because this will be a test at the end. <laughs> the only number that if I take its reciprocal value, which is the 1 over x on the left side over here of your calculator. Who could do that for me and tell me what shows up? If I just push the 1 over x button on here, look what happens. The number stays the same except for the 1 in front. Yeah. Every other digit remains identical. This is why black holes are believed to be based on the golden ratio. Think of this as a hole in space-time on both sides, a black hole and a white hole. You got an infinite singularity on both sides. So it's the only number that does that. No other number can do this. Maybe the square root of 10, you could argue, can do this. Because the square root of 10 will do a similar thing, but as you'll see here, if I take the square root of 10, 3.16227766, take its 1 over x, it doesn't put 1 in front. It just moves at a decimal position, and all the rest of the number is the same, 0.316227766. Okay? This is important for something called complex plane mathematics. And an assertion that we have in a paper we're writing right now is a solution for a real value associated with the complex plane and the imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. Because if I were to take this number, because the square root of 10 is the only number that can reciprocal square itself. If I were to take this number, and which is derived as root 10, just like this, square root of 10, and then I could say that this number is square root of 10 to the power of negative 1. Now, Euler himself said that any number to the power of negative 1 takes on some negative polarity characteristic. So it becomes n to the negative 1 equals negative n, right? Well, what happens when, when you do that, <coughs> If I take its reciprocal and then apply a negative to it, and then I multiply it by the square root of 10, watch what happens. So now I have a value for the square root of negative 1, which the fifth dimensional plane needs a mathematical basis for us to perceive it. Right? And this creates tesseracts, creates tesseracts through these planes. This is some of our latest research. The golden ratio does the same thing. 
it has this unique characteristic of the number string remaining ex exactly the same. And we don't question it much because we're like, okay, fine, 10, that's kind of related to one as a fractal. And the golden ratio, that's kind of like a super rare number and that's why all art is based on that. That's why the waist to hip ratio, right, is, is, is perceived to be ideal at that ratio, 0.618 to one or one to 1.618. And why all of the human anatomy, including DNA, is all based on it, right? It's beautiful, but that's rare. But that's for a perfection. Maybe the Vitruvian man is perfect, but how could each of us be perfect? If there's 7.3 billion people on the planet, whatever the latest number is right now, could you imagine that each one of us might have some sort of numbering system that nature would apply? If we've all got a unique identifier that nobody's fingerprint is the same. So it's almost like nature is so genius that it's mother nature or the universal one is so genius that it's got some sort of system to ensure that never kicks out the same number twice. With random number generators, that's very difficult to do. I make a random number generator. We had to apply AI technology to make sure in gradient descent, you know, mathematics of regression analysis to ensure it never kicks out the same number twice. We made it write music so it never stops writing music. It always is writing new music, never the same music twice. So when you think about it in those terms, how could any one of us ever be perfected like this and made infinite? We're going to get to that in a moment. <laughs> Is there something fundamental about 360 degrees? And what makes the golden mean the golden mean? And that's what I just basically was talking about. Nature tends to do things based on circles also. So I discovered a language inside of a circle that the basis of the circle of 360 degrees is fundamental. So I could give you many, many reasons for why that 360 degrees is so fundamental, but it's so genius that the Sumerians and the Egyptians used it for their calendar system, literally one degree for every day. And then they had a catch-up period at the end of the year when Sirius A would drop beneath the horizon. It would take five days for it to come back above the horizon. So they used that. They know as soon as Sirius A drops down, it's like, hey, we're not counting these days. We'll start counting again as soon as it comes back up. And they'd have a perfect calendar. Pretty genius, right? Like one degree for every day? Wow. But there's more to it than that because these numbers and the numbers we chose or humanity chose, maybe it wasn't chosen, maybe it was all just part of consciousness, were so beautiful and divine because they were the most highly composite numbers. Who knows what it means to be a composite number? It's the opposite of prime, right? Prime has no other divisible factors other than itself and the number one. But composite numbers could have lots of divisible factors, right? The highest numbers, right, that would have the highest degree of divisible factors are the ones you would want to use with measuring time. Because then you wouldn't have to express time in terms of fractions all day long, right? So that's why we used a base 60 system. Because base 60 is the highest number of divisible factors versus the size of the number. So it's kind of a very special number. So it's like we have 60 minutes in, a in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, 24 hours in a day, and two plus four equals six. So there's kind of something unique with this, right? This measurement system we have. Well, guess what? The Fibonacci pattern repeats itself every 24 numbers. And you could take the Fibonacci pattern and reduce it down to single digits. So the Fibonacci numbers are one, then you take one again. So it's like a self-informing system. One adds to one equals two. So those are all Fibonacci numbers. Then two and the last number one, you add them together. So it means three, right? Equals three. So then it's three plus two equals five. And then five plus three equals eight then eight plus five equals 13, then 13 plus eight equals 21, and then 34, and then 55, and then 89, and then 144, and 233, and on and on and on. Now, if I took those numbers and I collapsed them down into a single unit, single number, I would just add them within themselves. 
And this is called mod 9 analysis, mathematically. Those of you that are into astrology use it all the time in numerology, right? So you just drop that number down to a single digit, and guess what? The pattern repeats every 24 digits. It's a pattern. The Fibonacci pattern ties to the number 24. There's something very divine about the number 24. Because also, one of the things that I discovered was that all prime numbers are related to the number 24. Every prime number squared after 3, so excluding 2 and 3 only, all other prime numbers infinitely, you will find if you square that prime number, so 5 is prime, 7 is prime, 11 is prime, 13 is prime, 17 is prime, 19 is prime, 23 is prime, 29 is prime, 31 is prime. If you square those numbers, you will find they will always be a multiple of 24 plus 1, without exception. So it has 24-ness embedded within it. And those of you that know what a vector equilibrium is, do you know what a vector equilibrium is from Bucky Fuller's work, cube octahedron? If you flatten it down, it has 24 edges, it would make a mod 24. Okay, it is the basis of space-time. That's what it is. So I started noticing that there's this pattern against 360 degrees also in the study I was doing around the Great Pyramid. And I noticed that phi is just a positional point, even phi squared. Who knows what phi squared is? Golden ratio squared, 1.618, the same number I gave you. If you square that, it equals 2.618 with the identical string. That's super rare, right? So that means that the golden ratio minus 1 is equal to 1 over the golden ratio, and the golden ratio plus 1 is equal to the golden ratio squared. It's just very unique, right? You can't find another number that does this. It's like, whoa, this is like a super number. But then you notice, if I took the golden ratio squared and multiply it in a base 12 mathematical system, it becomes pi. So is pi really pi, or is it just the base 12 representation of the golden ratio squared? Is that kind of a mind blower? Hmm. All math constants are connected through this language. Right? And I discovered all the transformations of those right? through just the simple dropping of a pebble in still water. Using that exact same approach from our research and then applying it to another pebble dropping. So you have two pebbles. And where those waves intersect and overlap each other, it creates the beauty of the entire world around us through a vesica. Right? When they overlap, they create a vesica. That's the womb of creation. It's incredibly beautiful. So you take 360 can also be zero. Another thing that's really weird is if I took 360 degrees and I split it up an equal number of times, it will always have a digital sum, which is that numerological analysis taking it down to one digit, of the number nine without exception. So if I break up 360, I cut it in half, what would be the 180 degree opposites? 180 degrees, right? So I cut it into four part, so that's 90 degrees. So 180 is 1 plus 8 plus 0 equals 9. 90 equals 9, right? 45 equals 9. 22.5 equals 9, right? 11.25 equals 9. You guys seen this? Now, if you take a reciprocal value of a prime number, it will always create a period that will also sum to 9. So 1 over 7 on your calculator, just 1 divided by 7, equals 0.142857. And those six digits will repeat infinitely over and over and over. That's called a period, right? Guess what? Those six digits, 142857, add up to 27, and 27 adds up to 9. <laughs> right. So using this method, I was able to derive that it is true that 360 degrees is fundamental. And that if you just take it and separate it out and say 360, right, times its golden ratio, 0.618, equals 223. And then you subtract what's left over, 360 minus 223, it's going to give us 137. 137, the most enigmatic number in all of physics. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said 
We don't know how God pushed his pencil with this number. How the heck did he create this number? It's so enigmatic. It's the literal separation between light and dark. It's the thing that defines whether an electron will emit a photon or it will absorb it and bounce to a larger shell. That's what 137 is, the fine structure constant. It's the separation of the mirror between light and darkness. So then if I just take that 360 minus 223, I'm at 137, that's the alpha constant. The fine structure is defined as alpha. Then 223 minus 137, using the same Fibonacci approach, just going backwards, equals 86, which is related to light speed. It's the 86 of 1.86 times 10 to the fifth power, which is the speed of light, as a mile reference. Then we take 137 minus 86, I'm at 51. 51 divided by 360 degrees equals three point, is point, um, point 0.14, right? So basically it's pi, it's like a pi reference, just missing the rotations of three rotations around a circle. So you start learning this language that all the math constants are really about rotational landing positions on a circle and then reflected four ways in fourfold mirror symmetry. So then Stephen Hawking says, we'll never figure out a unified physics theory until we know why and how the constants interact with each other. It's been here all along. It's just inherent to the geometry and inherent to simple circles. So then you get down and you keep going with this. 137 minus 86 is 51 and then 86 minus 51 is 35. But then something weird happens. 51 minus 35 equals 16. So every time the numbers are getting smaller, and then 35 minus 16 equals 19, it goes backwards, right? There's some sort of mirror symmetry, and if you actually look at it, we have palindromes in mathematics, and palindromes have real meaning, they have depth. That's when you really start seeing the pattern of it. The palindrome is a number that I could say 432 has a palindrome of 234. Right, that's what a palindrome is. So, but now we're saying there's a vertical palindromicity as well. One six can flip to one nine, like a folding and unfolding. Interesting. So I then started noticing that musical notes also apply to the same circle. So musical notes then, if you break it up into seven parts, which is a heptagon, then, and you've got that beautiful same number pattern, which is 0.142857142857142857.14. You'll notice if you separate up a circle, the degrees will all have that same transposition of that same periodicity of numbers. They'll always sum to nine also. So then you've got a D note right at 51 degrees. You've got an E note, which is where we have tau, and these are all mathematical constants. So what I noticed is there's a correlation between notes and the positions of mathematical constants. That's why you could listen to that presentation that Alan made, which we're listening to the musical and geometric representation that we're watching on the screen. Because light and sound are just opposite conditions of the same thing. Gravity and radiation are just opposite conditions using the inverse square law. And it's as simple as x and 1 over x. It matches the Bohr atom model in physics. The Bohr atom model in physics shows us that we can define exactly the spectral lines of reflection of hydrogen perfectly just by looking at its wavelength and taking its reciprocal value of that wavelength. The reason that's possible is because you are an X, just like hydrogen. If I'm a hydrogen, imagine I'm hydrogen. I'm looking out the universe. I'm looking for other hydrogen. And I see all these other colors. I might find some other hydrogen, but I see all these other colors that are not me. They're my absorption spectra reflected back to me. That's the world around me. I'm X, and the world around me is my 1 over X. How do you bring it back to oneness, though? How do you bring that back through a golden ratio? Is it possible? This mythical idea where humanity can actually be brought back to a golden ratio and the perfection of that infinite decimal extension that's identical where we're brought into the divine. So numbers are the alphabet 
the mathematical constants I determined were the verbs, like verbs of action. In French, we say, je suis en train de quelque chose. I'm in the process of doing something. I'm in the train of doing something. It means it's incomplete. The way we do this, we could create gerunds, right, from nouns. We could say text is a, is a noun, right? Text is a noun. I could convert it into a verb, and I'll say to text. Or texting, I'll append an ing on the end of it. And then that means I'm texting. I'm not finished with it. I'm in the process of it. I might come back to it, right? Well, mathematical constants imply that incomplete action because they're never finished, just like pi is never finished. Right, because the number just keeps going out farther and farther and farther. Now, I had to make a calculator to be able to analyze numbers beyond what universities could analyze them. I have it on my computer here. I'll show you. Uh-oh, <laughs> of course I forgot my, my password, dang it. Of course, I thought I had it up here and I didn't have it pulled up. Well, I'll come back to it at the end. But I create a calculator that gives us real time values, I have to search for my password real quick, um, gives us real time values up to 301,000 digits of accuracy on every calculation, instantly. It's the largest calculator in the world. It's called the BFN. You might ask what the acronym stands for. <laughs> it's the one you're thinking. Big and number. Um, we use that to analyze long period strings of numbers. And we found tons and tons of patterns. See, I don't believe in entropy. I believe that what we call entropy and randomness is really just our inability, because we haven't raised our consciousness enough, to perceive God's encrypted pattern. When I say God, I don't mean some old guy. I mean it's us. I mean the entire universe is God. Everything is patterned. There's nothing with no pattern. It's just some patterns require you to really zoom out from your too close to the tree to see the forest perspective. And the farther and farther up you go into higher dimension of perspective, the more you're able to perceive those patterns. And they speak to you all the time. So numbers are the alphabet constants like I'm circling a diameter, incomplete action, right? All the actions are performed by these mathematical constants that have these irrational tails that are infinite. They're kind of magic, right? They're kind of angelic. They've got this aspect to them. And it's where all those intersections happen, where all the actions of the universe happens. And then circles, overlapping circles and intersecting circles, organize the syntax through geometric forms, the geometries. Now you could find inside Walter's 24 point perspective with all these lines, this looks like a mess of lines. I think probably the greatest IQ test we could do is to have kids be able to be looking inside that lines, all those lines of 24 point perspective and see how many shapes they can identify from it. Because our ability to perceive pattern as opposed to chaos is the highest level of intelligence for the universe. That's looking at the universe like God looks at the universe. The ability to perceive pattern versus chaos and entropy is the highest degree of intelligence we could achieve in this universe. We could even mark mankind's ascension based on its ability to perceive pattern versus chaos. Pi used to be chaos. Somebody figured it out. It's not chaos for us anymore. Look at all the cool things we can do with pi. I learned through learning languages that I needed to learn 2,000 verbs to be proficient at a language. And I didn't bother learning the nouns. 
I focused on verbs and verb conjugation first because every country in the world now studies English and they all focus on learning all the nouns. So if you don't know the nouns, I'm in Japan, I could say computer. That works too, <laughs> right? It does. You could literally use nouns interchangeably in English, just make it in their, you know, accents. <laughs> and it actually works. As long as you know the verbs, then they're like, oh, wow, you really speak well. <laughs> I, I figured out how to get to learning a language within three months by learning from the verbs. Learn from the actions first. Learn how to conjugate. Learn how to communicate sentences and everything. Don't worry about you sound like an idiot, right, sometimes. That may be true. But it's the idiots that are fluent within a few months, right? The other people are still stumbling because they were too afraid to say anything, right? On the other side of fear is realization of all of our dreams. That's just a truism. So basically what I realized was I had to learn 2,000 verbs, but then I started thinking, how many math constants do we know to be proficient at the universal language? To speak God's language. How many math constants do we know? Any ideas? You'd be lucky if you could name more than five because we're just not taught them in school. So here we are trying to speak God's language with, and comprehend what's happening around us with five words. Can you imagine? That's what we're doing. So we think that you know, in 1906, they announced that we believe that all the physics community got together. We finally understand the universe. There's no more new physics to learn. We got it all down. But never mind, we're still fumbling around right now trying to understand dark matter and dark energy. I spent, uh, I took Lawrence Krauss, who's a famous physicist, who won, who, whose research was awarded with two Nobel Prizes on dark matter and dark energy. And I was talking to him about this mathematics stuff and it was pretty funny because I'm like, so how much of the universe do we really understand? He's like, well, you know, we, we yeah. I mean, matter only represents probably like 4% of the whole universe. I'm like, so that means we don't know 96% of what is around us? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I'd say that's probably not an A. We're not getting an A on this one in our understanding. But guess what? The harmony of this is so beautiful. The universe is writ with this code of this language. And you'll notice something about this. These are harmonic numbers, They're all harmonics. They're all two to a power multiplied by three to the third power. Three to the third power is 27. 27 multiplied by 2 to the power of n creates all of the diameters and all of the distances, radii, from the sun center to each of the planets in our solar system. It's beautiful. So in Walter Russell's books, he actually references the speed of light as 186,400 miles per second. That's kind of an interesting number because the sun's diameter Take its average polar circumference and its equatorial circum circumference. You then look at their diameters of those values, right? What you're going to find is that it's 864,000. 864 to 865,000. Now that's interesting because not only is it a base 9 number because 8 plus 6 plus 4 equals 18, 1 plus 8 equals 9, right? It's a natural order of things. But also, how many seconds do we have in a day? Let's add it up. 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 equals what? Whoever gets it first gets 20 bucks. Huh? 86,400. You get. So wait a minute, are you telling me the Sumerians who came up with our time system came up with something so freaking genius mm -hmm. that it relates exactly as an order of magnitude to the diameter of the sun? 
Uh, if we were going to create a time system from scratch, I'd be like, okay, I'll be like trying to geometer this shit out, right? I'm like, all right, we got to figure out, let's take the sun because we're going around the sun, but the sun's also going around us, right? Because it's traveling, our solar system's traveling at almost 500,000 miles an hour, right, around the galaxy. Let's not forget that. So actually, if you look at it, the sun's kind of going like this. It's in a spiral rotation like this. And then we've got all the planets going around that as well. So it's kind of going in and out of each other, and it's all in motion, right? It looks like DNA. It looks like DNA. That's exactly what it is. So <laughs> we were going to figure this out perfectly. It'd be like, let's figure out how many seconds we want in a day. Well, let's make it tied to the number that would be associated with the diameter of the sun. And that's exactly what it is. Is that astounding to you? OK. Is it astounding to you then to realize that every planet in the solar system has relationships just like this? They're all based on the speed of light, all based on the precession of equinox, which is a 26,000, 25,920 year wobble, mm -hmm. that it's all perfect. Wait a minute. How fast is the Earth moving right now around the sun? Anyone know? 8,000. You got an eight. There's an eight in there. It's, <laughs> it's 18.6 miles per second. So what's the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second. So the Earth is rotating around in its orbit around the sun at a speed of light multiplied by you know, 10 to the negative fourth power, where it's 10,000 times slower than the speed of light? That's the speed of Earth? Isn't that kind of amazing? How could that be? Oh, and by the way, Jupiter is exactly 10 times smaller in its diameter, so it has a diameter of 86,400 miles. Again, you have to take the averages between the equatorial, right, because the as Walter says in, in his books, right, Universal One, the planets get fat. And they end up with, they get like a hula hoop around them, right? And so they get more moons and everything around them. Have you ever noticed that the number of moons has gone up tons around Jupiter since we were kids? I remember them announcing that they found the 17th moon of Jupiter. Now it's like 69. It's exactly like Walter says. Is it just that we couldn't see them before? I don't think so. They're literally popping out because it's a function of the relationship of vacuum. I want you to write something down. Write down zero to the power of zero. What is zero to the power of zero? Anyone know the answer? You would think zero, right? How many of you would say zero? Let's come on, raise your hand, don't be scared. Okay, it looks like about half-ish. How many of you would say the answer is one? You say one? Why do you say one? How could zero to the power of zero be zero? Nothing to the power of nothing equals one? Because it is still a constant. Nothing to the power of nothing equals one. Guess what, guys? The answer is one. You're like, yeah, I got that. You don't get 20 bucks. I didn't offer that. <laughs> Maybe next time, guys. So check this out. Check this out. So let's, let's just do a run a little test. Let's do 0 0.05 to the power of 0 0.05, right? Because let's just see what happens. We get to smaller and smaller numbers. So I'm going to take 0 0.05 to the power of, which is a little x to the y here, right? Zero. Five. So it gives me 0.86, right? <laughs> That's weird. How could 0 0.05 to the power of 0 0.05 give me that, right? I mean, let's go back to 0.5. Let's take 0.5 to the power, right, of 0 0.5. 0 0.707? It's smaller, but those are larger numbers, right? Wait, let's say I take zero, zero. I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five zeros, and then five. And then do the same thing for taking it to the power of. 
one, two, three, four, five zeros, and then five to the power of five zeros, one, two, three, four, five, five. Now it's 0.9999. Guess what happens? It converges to one. As you go to zero, it actually becomes one. So nothing to the power of nothing equals everything? What does that mean, guys? The universe is infinite. The universe is infinite. And what we've been seeing in dualistic terms as zeros and ones, there's nothing more basic in binary code than zeros and ones. We say, no, zero equals one and one equals zero. If you're not questioning your place in your reality after today, then I've literally failed. <laughs> but hopefully, what I'm going to do by taking you down this path is make you start to question and get some curiosity so you'll start finding these things on your own because that's what this age is all about. You don't need to be taught this doctrine of how to think anymore. We have to unlearn what we have learned. So this was me going through that process, drawing out all the planets in the solar systems, understanding what notes they represented, the musical notes based on their geometries, their frequencies. Kepler said it was all a harmony of the spheres, so I wanted to test that out mathematically. It is. It's beautiful. All the distances between the planets. They're all musical notes in 432 hertz tuning, Pythagorean tuning, every one. So simple. So look at this. Look at all the references we have to this number. So you wonder why Walter did all of his work as 4321. 432 times 2 equals what? 864. And 864,000 miles is the equatorial diameter. Seconds per day, 86,400. 86,400 miles is Jupiter. 86,400 kilometers per day is the orbital speed of Saturn, and the orbital speed of the moon is 86,400 kilometers a day. Wait a minute, weren't the kilometers, and who came up with the mile? Guess what, the mile was around since the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's the oldest book we have. They referenced the mile. Do you know that the Great Pyramid, we proved this, was built on all three measurement standards, imperial, ancient, the cubits, and the meter. It's all based on the simple math of three to the third power, which is 27 times two to its powers, and that's giving us all the planets and the relationships. It's all simple mathematics. And you could, you could Google all these. You're going to find this. What is the diameter of the moon? Do you know how hard it is to get a perfect solar eclipse? You know what has to happen? We're the only planet in the solar system that has a perfect solar eclipse. In order for that to occur, what has to happen is the planet has to have a moon that is exactly proportionally smaller than the sun versus its distance proportionally from the sun for that planet. So, for example, the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun, right? The moon is about 240,000 uh, miles away from the Earth. But that happens to be exactly 400 times approximately. It's like 240-something thousand. 243,000, I think, is what it comes out to. It comes out to be exactly 400 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun as it is from the Earth to the Moon. And so, therefore, if the Sun is 864,000 miles, then I have to divide that by 400 to get the diameter of the Moon. What's the diameter of the Moon? 2,160 miles. That's exactly 400 times smaller than the Sun's diameter. 
It's a matrix. <laughs> I could see it on your faces like, wait, what? All this stuff we've been learning about material science, even Max Planck said, guys, it's not about that. There is no matter as such, is how Max Planck describes it. We have to conclude that the entire universe exists as a result of a conscious mind. This was, Max Planck was the sponsor of Einstein. Without Max Planck, we would have had Einstein and all of his theories would have stayed in the patent office in Switzerland. Look at that. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So there's an ordering around 24 sides. So this is the Fibonacci pattern, I told you. Take it down to one number, so you got one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, five plus three equals eight, eight plus five equals 13. Take that down to one plus three equals four. So now we've got four. The next number is 21, because two plus one equals three, right? The next number is 34. Three plus four equals seven. The next number is 55. Equals five plus five equals 10. Back to one again. 89 comes back to 8, 144, 1 plus 4 plus 4 equals 9, right? Now, you take this around, you go infinite with that, it'll always be these same numbers, and look what happens. Look at this ordering system. Take the 180 degree opposite number of each other, 1 and 8 down here, and 1 up there, what's that equal? 9. Let's do it again. 9. 2 plus 7 equals 9, 3 plus 6 equals 9, 5 plus 4 equals 9, 8 plus 1 equals 9, 4 plus 5 equals 9, 3 plus 6 equals 9, 7 plus 2 equals 9, 1 plus 8. It's always 9s. Is that the vector equilibrium inside That is. That's a vector equilibrium, Metatron's cube. So using this approach, I published a paper, discovered a new kind of number that we called quasi-primes because of their periods had the same characteristic as prime numbers where they always sum to the number nine. So that wiped out tons and tons of numbers that were divisible by two and three. And it just so happens that then we could use that as an algorithm to predict primes infinitely. So accurate and infinite prime prediction from novel quasi-prime analytical methodology. When I published this paper, I got two invitations. One was to the Vatican. Because of that, the shape of the pattern formed a Templar cross. So I got asked to give the presentation on this at the Vatican, so I did. That was fascinating. Not to the Pope, but it was a bunch of cardinals and stuff. And then I got an invite to teach it to the Dalai Lama in his palace in India, so I flew to India and spent a day teaching him this, and we talked about physics, and he's big time into physics, he loves physics. He writ, wrote a book about it called The Universe in a Single Atom. And what I'd realized was that all the red numbers, and this is my personal notes from this moment, all the red, orangish numbers that you see there were prime numbers. And of course I used a mod 24 because I knew there was some 24-ness associated with it because of the Fibonacci pattern, and because every prime number squared after three was a multiple of 24 plus one. The nice thing about math is math is math. It's like no one can refute it. So number file, which is like a geek math thing on like YouTube, tried to do it. Someone requested a debunking of it, and they came back and verified it. They did one part of the test. They said we tested if any, if any prime number exists that is not a multiple of 24 plus 1 when squared. And they said he's right. So it came out to be totally right. So these are all the prime numbers, the red numbers. And does that look like a pattern to you? Mm -hmm. What you're really looking at, and the reason I was doing this research was because I was trying to understand, I was working with the Sim Harriman at the time, and he's like, look, can you see if there's a number theory approach to gravity and radiation? And I had posited with another physicist, uh, you know, colleague of mine, that gravity is relational to one, fours, and sevens, so straight, scalar lines. So even consciousness brings it down to that. And that electromagnetism has a um, curvature associated with it. So two against a flat line, 
the bottom, five, which is just an upside down backwards two. You ever notice that two, if you write down two on a piece of paper, it's exactly the upside down backwards opposite of five. So somebody was genius in coming up with this because one over two is 0.5. And one over five is 0.2. Well, what about one over four? Does that equal seven? Because it kind of looks like the shapes of a seven. Four does, right? Well, it is when you consider it's 0.25 and two plus five equals seven. Our numbering system is genius. The shapes are geometric. Everything has to have a resonance in this matrix of mind. Geometry has a resonance. It couldn't be any other way. Everything has to be associated with its own shape and wave function. So then all the numbers that were not red, I wanted to understand what's the common denominator of all the numbers that are not red in these spokes that are red. And what I found was what the common denominator was is they were all divisible by prime numbers. They were all divisible by the red numbers. And that there are no numbers that exist that are neither red nor green in the spokes, except for the yellows, which is the prime squared. So you can see where you got 77 there and 125 and 221 and 245 and 341. Those would then, by definition, they must be, right, green. So 77, 125, 221, 245, and 341. That means they must be divisible by prime numbers, right? So when I started looking at this, I then figured out how to use this to crack encryption. Because there's a geometric pattern for prime factorization. And that's the foundational basis of it. So constants emerge from primes and geometry with other constants. So this is how I started discovering how constants. So the constants are born in the middle. So the blue numbers are all mathematical constant positions. They're all connected. So you can see here, next to all these numbers, you just divide them by 360 degrees in base 10 and 432 degrees in base 12. And you can see that each one of these are defining either musical notes in Pythagorean tuning or Omega constant, light speed, phi, phi, pi, C sharp note, pi. These are all math constants that sit inside here. And guess what? There's thousands of math constants. We've been dealing with only a handful at this level. Maybe at the academic level, we probably deal with maybe 100. So you can maybe speak a little bit more words with the universe, but we want to get it to at least 2,000 to really actively communicate, don't we? So all is number. So all of Walter's work was based on waves. And what I found is how to apply all of these waves and wave perturbations to prime numbers and their distribution and their musical representations. So that's what you watched in the video in the beginning. Numbers emerge from vortexes. It's a vortex. These ratios are fundamental ratios. You've probably seen lots of drawings like that by Walter, but not necessarily the numbers that emerge out of them. This is quaternion symmetry. This is the paper that I wrote it out when I discovered it, that there was an x and 1 over x relationship across all of that that then could be defined and played as musical notes, which is what you listened to in that video. Another mathematical constants, x and 1 over x relationship. You're just going around the circle. Every number has its x and 1 over x. So you could say that I'm x and the universe around me is 1 over x, right? This is another representation of how DNA is representing all the math constants as well and the way it twists in a 12 strand. So you could say that that's a torus. You look at it as a com one complete torus, even. All math constants emerge from this separation of light from darkness of 137. They're all just transformations, simple transformations, very simple. So I could take the golden angle of 137.5. 
one over the golden angle is phi squared, 2.618. 261.8 degrees divided by 360 degrees, 0 0.7272. 0 0.7272 times 432, which is 1.2, it's a base 12 versus the base 10, is 31416. Just like I mentioned, so maybe pi is not so separate from the golden ratio after all. And this is true for all of them, the Euler-Mascheroni number. 1 minus, right, 0.3819 times 360 equals 137.5. So divided by 360 equals 0.1718, which is the Euler number minus 1. Every constant is just a wave function emerging out of base 10 and base 12 mathematics. It's forming a beautiful symphony. There's no constant that we know of that doesn't fall within this as just a transformation of another constant. Is that not a metaphor that we could apply to human beings on Earth? We perceive ourselves as so different from everybody else, but maybe they're just some slight transformation and the way they see the world in and of itself is beautiful because it's not the same as how we see the world. We don't want to see the world in the same ways all the time. So every math constant can be derived relational to other constants. This is a universal language. Even the Planck length can be derived in a simple equation of the square root of 10 plus 3 divided by 10 plus 1 times 10 to the negative 34th power gives us perfectly the Planck length. If it's not simple, it's wrong. Period. And everything mirror reflects across these different x and y axes. So whenever you have pi times 360, or you could say 314 degrees would have in its opposite mirror reflection across the center vertical line, right? 314.16 over here is mirror reflecting to this number right here in degrees, 45.84 degrees. But if I, that by, if I divide that by 360, it gives me 4 over pi, 1.273. So 4 over pi is a fundamental constant that relates to the moon as well. All of it is just mirror reflections around the same circle. We think of it as all separate and different, but it's not really. It's just mirror reflections. Geometry is sound suspended, and matter is light suspended. Geometry is the nexus of mathematics and music. And literally, this is the work that I did that then led to the periodic wave of elements. So this suggests with wave doubling math, 1 doubles 2, 2 doubles 4, 4 doubles 8, there should be 137 total, con a total periodic elements. It's really just one element going through its life cycle, adding electrons, right, adding protons through its stability cycles and then into its instable cycles, right, with very, very short half-lives. But that means that hydrogen, if you really take this and say, okay, if I know that the actinoids and the lanthanoids are here and these are doubled math, then I can just have them to come up with these with a couple isotope positions in here. And then I can have them again to get to the carbon and silicon octaves, then have them again, and only hydrogen shows up. Well, that's just because we can't perceive the other hydrinos that are prior to hydrogen. Just like Walter supposed, he's correct. And what this then shows us is that we can separate out each of the families from the noble gases, the halogens, the oxygens, the nitrogens, the carbons, the borons, it's all just simple separations of this circle. It's beautifully simple. So I'll finish with this, how do you return to oneness? So let's take out our calculator again. So I showed you that the golden ratio is unique because it could create this number string that's infinite, right? I could pull up at least my short calculator for this. And for those of you interested to see that once I get my 
calculator up, getting through my password, then I will do this. So here we go, calculator. Okay, so now I showed you that the square root of five, right, plus one divided by two equals golden ratio. And that one over that value gives us the same number string, doesn't it? The only thing that's changed is the one in front. You guys see that? Okay. But that doesn't work with other numbers. Let's say I were to take a, a number like 23, right? And if I take that number and one over exit, nothing close to 23, right? So how could that work? Someone give me any number. 42. 42. Everybody always says 42. All right. I'm going to show you a way to transform 42 into two numbers that return it to oneness that are identical. Square it. Add 1. Square root it. Now double what's left to the left of the decimal. So add back 42, because it's a wave. 42 is the center of the wave. And now take its 1 over x. Look at that. Cool. Every number that exists can return to oneness. Until you do that, you will have a period, right? So if I took the number 42, I took its 1 over x, I'm going to have this, you know, period inside the number, just like the number 7. If I take number 7, 1 over exit, I got 1, 4, 2, 8, 5, 7, and that six digits repeats itself. If I did it with the number 11, or number 13, rather, look, these numbers repeat themselves, 7, 6, 9, 2, 3. 7, 6, 9, 2, 3, 7, 6, 9, 2, 3. This will go, the larger the number is, the more you will see that. You'll have a repeating pattern. Until you figure out how to take that number and make it divine. So you could say that the number to the left of the decimal, the number 42 in the example you gave, is the conscious mind. It's conscious. It's what you think you are, separate from the rest of the world. And the world around it is this, which is a repeating pattern, 238095, 238095. Sound familiar? You ever had patterns in your life? Making the same mistakes over and over and over again? Getting reincarnated and then having it happen again and again and again? <laughs> it's called folding and unfolding and then folding and unfolding again. Well, now we could take that number, and if I were to take that and add 42 to it, so I'm going to take the subconscious mind. Carl Jung says it's not by illuminating, right, and changing the darkness. It's by bringing light to the understanding of the darkness that we become enlightened. And I believe he's absolutely right. So I can then take the number 42 and add it to the front of this, so the conscious mind added to the subconscious mind. And look what happens. It gets me closer, but when I went over exit, it's not quite the same, is it? See, 02380952380095 and 02379603, so it breaks down, doesn't it? It's only when I figure out to take it, square it, Add the 1. Take its square root. Add back the value, 42. And then 1 over x that, that you get the infinite perfection. A merger between the conscious mind, the number 42. Each of us could be assigned a number. Our repetition, life cycles, and patterns that we have could just be our 1 over x experience. The larger our number, the larger the cycle the more difficult it is to perceive that pattern.
doesn't mean the pattern doesn't exist. It's just we haven't raised our consciousness yet enough to be able to see it as the universe does. So now from this, what's the value of this? I learn how to use this to apply it to compression of data. With compression ratios now that we're seeing that can be way, way, first of all, you could take any compressed data and apply this approach to it because now with this, I can solve the golden ratio just by giving one digit, can I? Square root of five plus one divided by two. This is the golden ratio, right? But what if I didn't have any of that information? What if I just wanted to transmit the number 0.6? So I take 0.6, take its 1 over x, gives me this. So now I take one, I just take the first few digits from this, 1.66, right? And then I take this and I add one to it. And it will converge over time as I keep doing this operation. It'll get closer and closer, whoops. So 1.6, okay, and then I just add one, Whoa. okay. 1.6, okay, and then add one, then one over x, and add one, then one over x, and what are you gonna start noticing? I only gave one digit to the other side, didn't I? And as I keep doing this, it will converge to the golden ratio. See what's happening? So I don't need to transmit more data than one digit to transfer, and no equation even, to transfer infinite amount of data. Because knowing that it has to comply with what I call monadicity, numerical monadicity, returning to oneness through this perfect irrational tail, there's only one number that can do it. So in that, you can compress data. Huh? I said, in that, you can compress data. What was the term? Monadicity. Monad. Return to oneness. So the lesson for all of us here, doesn't matter what mistakes we've made. The life experience we have is 100% our choice. We could choose to see this place as a prison, a hell, or we could choose to see it as a paradise. It will be as you choose it for you. If you think you can or you think you can't, you will be right. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. This is John Bonsell, President of the University of Science and Philosophy. I want to thank you for participating in our wonderful 2022 homecoming, Moving into the Future living a life triumphant. So if you would like to reach out to us, we would love for you to visit our website at philosophy.org. And anything that you could do to help us promote this message throughout the world would be greatly appreciated. And thank you.